David Scarpa, you are the writer of All the Money in the World, the upcoming movie by Ridley Scott. Uh, first of all, uh, what drew you to this story? Um, I was initially attracted to this story. I was sort of searching for something that was about money, about the topic of money and sort of how it controls people's lives uh, and determines sort of their fates. Uh, and I had always heard about the story of the, uh, J the Getty kidnapping in terms of the, uh, the boy's ear having been cut off. Uh, and that was always sort of a, a, a story as a little kid that, I, uh, that I'd heard in sort of a slight horror story kind of, kind of vein. Uh, and then um, I wound up running across a chapter in a book via one of our producers, Quentin Curtis, uh, a chapter in this book called uh, uh, Painfully Rich by John Pearson uh, that discussed how, uh, and, and there was an interesting, the, the main point of it that really struck me was the idea that J. Paul Getty was the richest man in the world at the time. He had a billion dollars and uh, had enough money to pay, pay the ransom or his grandson's ransom and yet simply chose not to. Uh, and that to me struck me as a jumping off point for a kind of a Shakespearean drama about a man who loves his grandson, but is so addicted to money that he can't bring himself to pay the ransom. Uh, and that was sort of a, was a point of departure for a larger story about the money and the role it plays in our lives. Mm -hmm. What kind of research did you do uh, as you were developing this story? Uh, we obviously had uh, John Pearson's book, Painfully Rich, uh, which was written in sort of collaboration with, uh, with Gail Getty, who's one of the subjects of our movie. Uh, and then there were a number of other books. There were articles, there were contemporaneous articles or, con or articles about, written about that time. Uh, and as well, we also did some independent interviews with people who were involved in the case. Mm -hmm. So um, what's interesting about the movie is it's, it's structured as a thriller. Can you talk a bit about uh, structuring the film as a thriller and uh, coming up with, uh, I mean, obviously the story itself is very exciting, but what kind of work did you have to do uh, in order to make it work as a, a thriller? Well, I mean, that was what made the movie interesting to me is, you know, the movie's kind of a synthesis of a conventional kidnapping thriller and what we'll call the great man movie, right? Like uh, Citizen Kane or The Aviator or something like that. And on their own, each of those uh, aren't necessarily as interesting as what happens when you smash those two genres together. Uh, so par part of what we're doing here is kind of trying to meld those two genres and sort of, sort of uh, make them work off of each other. Uh, so in terms of making, making it work as a thriller, um, I think in a, in a sense, the, part of the thing is the kidnap genre, you know, inherently has a thriller sort of aspect to it, which is this whole idea of kid, you know, child, usually it's a child gets kidnapped. And then, um, uh, you know, the, there's a whole drama surrounding how are we going to rescue this child, right? Um, how are we going to get the money? How are we going to find the kidnappers? In this case, there's really no problem, right? In the sense that they can easily solve the problem simply by paying the money. They've got the money, they've got all the money they need, literally, as the saying goes, all the money in the world. Uh, the problem only exists inside the heads of the characters, right? If Getty himself could pay the ransom, the movie's over, right? So the battle is not about, it's not about the kidnappers as the bad guys, or even as Getty as the bad guys, it's money itself and the power that money has over everybody in the drama. Uh, and so that's really, I think, where the, the unique aspect comes from. One of the things that really resonates about this movie today is uh, about how, uh, you know, all the money in the world can't buy you happiness and it can yeah. lead to emptiness. Um, and, you know, needless to say, we have a president right now uh, right. who wishes he had the kind of wealth that right. Getty had. Um, were you at all looking at those kinds of parallels when you were writing this? I don't think, I mean, keep in mind, it was written probably, I mean, it, I had been working on it since about 2006, um, mm -hmm. and it was written probably around 2015, 14. Um, so Trump really wasn't that big of a factor at the time, but certainly the idea of, of I mean, I think the disparities in wealth that we have right now are kind of even more sort of extreme, you know? Uh, and I remember one of the things that sort of struck me before I was writing the story was reading a quote from a billionaire, not Trump, 
but who basically said that he could never feel financially secure unless he had a billion dollars, right? He would never feel safe unless he had that much money. Um, and that sort of was another, you know, it's sort of this, this, you know, it was sort of a profound sort of state, a glimpse into the mind of, of somebody with that kind of wealth. But I think there's, I mean, I think there's obvious parallels to be drawn after the fact to the idea that, you know, we've got all this money. I mean, we've got all this money ostensibly for things like tax cuts. And yet, you know, we don't have enough money for things like food stamps. Right. I mean, people will make this literally make the same argument side by side, you know, that we can't afford Medicaid or we can't afford uh, food stamps or we can't afford. There's any number of things that we can't afford. And yet we can afford to do this. Right. Um, so there's an obvious parallel to be drawn there. Yeah, I thought it was interesting how he says he can't afford to pay the ransom for his own grandson, but he is later seen buying a priceless piece of art that right. he can't afford. Yeah. Um, and he believes, I mean, the interesting question is, does he believe it? And on some level, he does believe it. He's not being disingenuous. And I think it's an interesting question is, you know, when people say we don't have enough money for children to have school lunches or we don't have enough money for food stamps or we don't, you know, so that a kid can eat one meal a day, you know, the more horrifying idea is that they might actually believe that, right? They may truly believe that they don't, that America doesn't have that kind of money. Mm -hmm. What was the toughest scene for you to write or, or toughest part of the script for you to crack? Um, the truth is it wasn't all that tough. I mean, I had had a long time to sort of wrestle with it, you know, on my own uh, prior to writing it in terms of figuring out what I wanted to do. So it was not a big struggle, you know. Uh, I was able to write it fairly quickly because I pretty much worked it all out and I had obviously done a lot of research uh, and it just sort of came together very quickly. When Ridley Scott came aboard, what changes were made, if any? Uh, very little. I mean, mostly it was cuts. He seemed to like, he liked the script, you know. He liked it and, and wanted, to, wanted to do it as largely as it was. I mean, a lot of it was just sort of a lot of cutting back because the thing, if we had actually shot what I originally wrote, probably would have been over three and a half hours at least. So we had to do, do a lot of cutting. Uh, but for the most part, it stayed very close. What kinds of things did you cut, if you can remember? Uh, I don't really remember the specifics. I mean, there's stuff sort of on, with Gail on her own, you know, Gail and her friends. Uh, you know, some of the stuff wound up sort of coming out of the movie in the in the cut, meaning after we already shot it, uh, we didn't, you know, we had to sort of prune the movie down. Um, but, um, you know, and, and some of it is sort of more giving more room to breathe to uh, to Getty himself to speak or to Gail, et cetera. But I think all that stuff is really is really hit on in the movie that we've got. You do cover a lot of ground in it for a, a two hour film. And particularly, I think of like the first act of it, um, uh, when you get into the family history and his connection, uh, Getty's relationship with his son and his grandson. And it's really yeah. very well done in the beginning. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's a lot of it's a lot of it's a lot to cover. Certainly, I mean, part of the thing is what is tricky is if you make it feel sort of like this. The actual kidnapping took place, and it took place over whatever, like four months. If you make it feel sort of like a breathless thriller, it'll actually feel like it's taking place over a weekend. You know, so you actually have to have sort of a sense of passage of because I mean, it's all actually kind of like an almost outrageous amount of time that it took for for Getty to finally put up the money. You know, uh, so you need actually to have that sense that it takes a while for all this stuff to to finally resolve. Can you talk a, a bit about developing the characters played by Michelle Williams as uh, uh, Paul's mother and Mark Wahlberg? Uh, can you talk a bit about the development of those characters? Um, Gail's character, you know, obviously both of them are based in fact. Uh, Gail is, uh, Gail, uh, uh, you know, I mean, I think the big, the big thing in terms of developing Gail was that, you know, at the time um, there was a feeling, and it's actually stated in the movie, which was that, you know, quote, in the, this is the 1970s, and these are men who were basically born, you know, Getty himself probably wasn't even born in this century, was that a kidnapping negotiation was no place for a woman. And so they kept, uh, kept Gail out of the negotiation as much as possible. Uh, and that today, I think, would almost feel kind of weirdly implausible that a, that a woman could be kept out or, you know, out of her own child's kidnapping negotiation. Uh, and so, and there's also a desire to really keep her, keep her involved in the drama as much as possible. 
So that was sort of one big sort of step, which was to, to put her really very much forward in terms of what she was, in terms of her experience. Uh, but both of those characters are, are, are true real life characters, where the real characters are involved. It's another way that the movie feels uh, especially prescient, you know, seeing yeah. this uh, woman determined and, and taking charge of uh, her son's destiny. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's. I mean, one of the things that sort of struck me when I watched the movie because Michelle plays it tough. Like Michelle plays the character very, very, very hard. Uh, and I sort of, in some part of me, is saying, "Wow, is she a, is she a little bit too tough? Is she going to alienate?" And it's. I think, in a weird way, it sort of taps into, frankly, the way I think people are feeling right now. You know, which is, I think there is a certain amount of of anger. You know, and I think people can relate to that. So, and you know, in the sense of seeing her up against this man who really wants to cut her out, cut her out of you know, her own son's kidnapping. Mm -hmm. Something I always like to uh, ask writers uh, when I'm interviewing them, uh, what is your process like? Do you have a, a sort of uh, routine that you get into when you're writing? Has it changed over time? No, I mean, I've said I'm pretty lazy. Uh, <laughs> I don't, I tend to write things when I'm under a lot of pressure, you know? So it's, it's um, I do get, uh, you know, I don't have this thing where I show up at nine o'clock every morning and I've got all my pencil sharpened and then I work perfectly. You know, I mean, uh, I tend to write really slowly and then I get really a lot faster as as I run out of time to do that, <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, that's it's as much like a, a college term paper as anything else for me. I've never really changed from that. Uh, and yet I still manage to get, you know, it all gets done in the same time. You know, it's just a matter of how much stress I have to deal with at the end. Mm -hmm. you know? This film has, uh, of course, been in the news lately because of some unfortunate circumstances uh, yeah. with uh, Kevin Spacey. I don't want to relitigate that because yeah. it's out there, but I did want to ask when word came down that Scott was planning to reshoot parts of this movie with Christopher Plummer and make the release date, which he did successfully, yeah. what was your reaction to that? Well, initially they called me into kind of, they called me on the phone and they said, you know, this was like about a week after the whole Spacey business went down. Uh, and they said, um, we need you to come in right away, like right now. So I came down, I was there in about three minutes. Um, and they took me into a, basically like a glass box, like a glass walled conference room. And they said, this can't leave this room. If it does, the movie will be ruined. Uh, and they said, we're going to, and I, and I immediately launched into, well, here's how we need to solve this. Here's how we need to, you know, this is the reality of the situation. They said, no, we're going to reshoot, you know, we're, we're talking about reshooting the Spacey role. And I said, well, there's obviously no way we can make our release date. And they said, no, we're going to make our release. We're going to keep our release date. And to be honest, I walked out of there and they, part of it was, we may need you to rewrite some of these scenes to sort of sweeten the pot for these actors, you know, see if, if they can entice or may have to redevelop something for the actor. They, they didn't specify, you know, I, necessarily who, whether it was, whether it was Plummer at that point, but I honestly walked out of there not believing they were going to do it. Like, I believe they intended to do it. I wasn't sure they were actually going to be able to do it. And so in my own mind, it was sort of, okay, what are, what's going to happen when they're not able to do this? Uh, but then literally within 48 hours, you know, I got a text message saying, hey, we need such and such from you. Plumber needs pages. And I said, oh, because well, we have another character, we have another actor, Charlie Plumber, right? So I assumed Charlie Plumber was asking for pages. And I said, well, Charlie Plumber's already got the script. And he said, no, it's Christopher Plumber. So that's how I basically found out that he was, he was our, our new getty. Uh, and they managed to do it. You know, once I think, once they had all the actors on board, uh, there was no question that they were going to be able to do it because, you know, uh, Ridley, Ridley knows pretty much immediately what, what he can do and what he can't do. Like, there's never any question of what, once he says he's going to do something, whether or not he can do it. So. Yeah, I think the moral of the story should be uh, never underestimate uh, octogenarians. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> an inspirational story. Sir. What excuse? I mean, I to ask myself what excuse I have not to get anything done. <laughs> I, I had a deadline for Ridley basically around the same time, and it was there's no way I cannot make this. <laughs> there's no way I'm going to have the excuse of not making this. You know, so I had to get it done. And certainly, I mean, the film uh, has had a positive reaction from people who've seen it. You guys received three Golden Globe nominations. Um, you, are, you are yourself in the Oscar conversation now. What has that positive feedback about the movie meant for you guys? I think it's just terrific. I mean, I think we're all really thrilled. You know, I mean, it's like, it's been, it's been, it's, it's been a struggle, although I've got to say it's never been a struggle in the sense of feeling like we were 
we always felt like we were making a good movie. Like we were, we had sort of logistical struggles, you know, or, or I don't know whether you call them logistic. I mean, it's like, we've had a weird series of events, but we've always had really been confident about the movie we were making, you know? And I think there's a lot of confidence about when you're on board with Ridley and with these actors, particularly, you know, I mean, we have the best people. So we always felt good about what we were doing. Uh, so yeah, I mean, the whole thing has really been terrific. I mean, again, a lot of, a lot of, with a big asterisk next to it, it's been a terrific experience. Uh, well, it is a really great movie, and uh, I am glad that you guys made your release date and that uh, people are going to be able to see it. David Scarpa, thank you so much, and congratulations. Thank you so much for having me. Take well, care. Thanks. You too. Bye.